All right, I think it's three o'clock. And hello, this is the National Council for uh, Preservation Education's third webinar of its summer series for interns and others new to or interested in the Federal Historic Preservation Program. Today, five panelists, all from the National Park Service, will speak on the theme of cultural landscapes and historic structures. This series is offered by NICP in collaboration with the National Park Service's Cultural Resources, Partnerships, and Science Directorate in Washington, DC. I'm Julie Johnson, the co-director of the National Council's internship program. I want to welcome all the NICP interns, other interns, fellows, staff, and volunteers attending today's webinar. I'm delighted you can participate and look forward to your questions and comments, which I invite you to put in the chat at any time. Before I introduce our panelists, I wanna briefly mention NICP's publication program. Many of you may know that the National Council is a nonprofit organization whose members are educational institutions that offer degrees in historic preservation, heritage conservation, and cultural resource management. There are over 60 institutional members from universities and colleges from all over the United States. Part of NICP's mission is to facilitate the collection and dissemination of information and ideas concerning historic preservation and historic preservation education. To that end, NICP offers to its members and free to the public, the journal called Preservation Education and Research or PERV which is a peer reviewed journal published annually by the University of Minnesota Press. You can find the first 10 volumes of PERN from 2008 to 2018 at the organization's website, that's ncpe.us. And I encourage you to download these volumes. The articles cover a wide range of topics such as preserving intangible cultural assets, which is found in volume one, Preservation and Morale Building in Post-War West Germany in Volume 5, and Preserving the Histories of Urban Renewal and Historic Preservation in Volume 10. Students and postdocs, usually working with faculty, have had their work published in PER. For example, Volume 20 includes the article, Preserving the Painful, by a professor and a student from Dalhousie University. It discusses how to use preservation as part of a larger reconciliation process related to the trauma and forced assimilation of indigenous peoples at Canadian Indian residential schools. I mention this because the projects you're working on and in some instances, the research that you're doing could be of interest to the larger preservation community, especially if it addresses larger themes or attempts to answer questions common to multiple sites. If you wanna take your work a step further by getting published, you're invited to review the submission guidelines at nicp.us slash publications. I'm delighted to be joined today by Paloma Belazny, the Youth Programs Coordinator at MPS's Cultural Resources Office of Interpretation and Education in Washington, DC. Paloma is responsible for assembling the speakers in the webinar series. And she wants to take a few minutes to explain how the National Park Service is organized. And let's see, Paloma, do you have a few words you'd like to say? I, I do, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Paloma Belazny and I'm the Youth Programs Coordinator for the Cultural Resources Directorate at the Park Service's Washington office. Thank you all for joining us today and especially to our speakers for sharing their time with us. Please do enter any questions you have into the chat throughout the presentations. And we hope to have a few minutes after all the presentations for some Q&A. Um, we may go over the top of the hour, so I do hope you'll be able to stick around um, and hear our Q&A. But before we begin from our panelists, um, I'm gonna provide you with a very short snapshot of how the Department of the Interior and the Park Service is organized so that you can better place our speakers. Um, if you've attended a previous NICP webinar this month, you've heard my summary before, but please do indulge me for a few minutes 
for the sake of those tuning in for the first time. And if you are, thank you for joining us. Uh, first slide, please. Great. The Department of the Interior was founded in 1849 and currently has about 70,000 employees. The DOI is comprised of 11 bureaus and seven offices, and the Park Service is actually just one of those 11 bureaus, which are all listed on this slide. Next slide. In 2018, the department was reorganized from many different regions recognized by all the various bureaus into 12 unified regions to be used by all bureaus. And on this slide, you see all the, the 12 DOI regions. Next slide, please. Administratively, though, the Park Service operates within the framework of the Park Service's legacy regions seen on this slide. And the Park Service has seven of these regions plus the Washington office. Uh, so to see which DOI regions fit within the boundaries of these um, legacy regions, you have to overlay the map of the DOI regions um, with this one and do that in your mind. Um, each region, each legacy region, has one or several regional offices within its boundaries. Next slide, please. There are currently 423 units of the National Park Service. Although there are 19 different naming designations like National Historic Site, National Monument, we in the Park Service very often call all of our units National Parks. And this amazing map you see on the screen has all 423 units and is available on nps.gov if you're interested. In addition to managing 423 units, the Park Service administers a number of programs that implement the Park Service's role in the National Preservation Program. And that was the subject of our first webinar. These programs, for the most part, are mainly administered out of the Washington office. Next slide, please. The Washington office, or WASO, is a separate office from regions. And here on the slide, you see an org chart of WASO, starting with the director of the Park Service at the top. And the director has various deputies and associate directors. And they manage national programs, national policy, and budget. And two of our panelists you'll hear from today work in the WASO office under the Cultural Resources, Partnerships, and Science Directorate, as do I. Um, and with that very brief framework, I will hand the spotlight to Julie. Thanks. All right. Um, let's see if I can do this. <laughs> All right. Thank you for that explanation, Paloma, and for your time and energy putting together the entire webinar series. It's been a pleasure working with you this summer. As I said, we have five panelists today. You may put any questions for them in the chat and we'll respond to them most likely after the uh, webinar is completely concluded. I will also provide contact emails for all the speakers at the end, as well as information about our next webinar, which is the last in our four part series. I want to introduce our first two speakers, Susan Dolan and Stephen Pisani, who presently will present jointly on the topic of park cultural landscapes and park historic structures. Susan uh, Dolan is a historical landscape architect and national manager of the MPS Park Cultural Landscapes Program. Her responsibilities include developing, implementing, and overseeing a service-wide landscape preservation program that includes research, planning, stewardship, training, and technology development. And she previously served as a, the historical landscape architect for Mount Rainier National Park. Stephen Pisani is the Bureau Historical Architect and Program Manager for the Wasso Cultural Resources Partnerships and Science Directorate, Directorate Park Historic Structures Program. Prior to coming to Washington, D.C., he spent nearly 25 years in the National Park Service working as a historical architect and project manager in the Northeast region and at the George Washington Memorial Parkway. So I'm going to turn it over to Susan and Stephen. Hi there, thank you very much, Julie. 
and Paloma. It's really an honor to be here with you. Thanks everyone for tuning in. So Steve and I are going to talk about the national programs that are the Historic Structures and Cultural Landscapes programs. Stephen, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Good afternoon, folks. As Julie said, my name is Stephen Pisani. I'm the Bureau Historical Architect and the uh, Park Historic Structures Program Manager. Uh, she said before I started with the National Park Service around 1991 and prior to that, uh, I worked as a seasonal uh, employee during college, uh, working on the preservation trades. And I'm Susan Dolan. I'm the Bureau of Historical Landscape Architect and Manager of the Park Cultural Landscapes Program. And I want you all to know that I began working for the National Park Service as a Nick Pete intern in 1995. So what are historic structures and cultural landscapes? And we're going to give you just kind of a glimpse of this today. You'll hear more of both. Uh, so Stephen, but what is a historic structure? Sure, a pre-contact or historic structure is a constructed work created to serve human activity. Some examples uh, of that include buildings, monuments, dams, canals, fortifications, temple mounds, and kivas. Right, and a cultural landscape, very simply, is a geographic area uh, that exhibits cultural values. And these are highfalutin definitions, really, but the realm that we're talking about here is historic places. And these are two halves of the same coin, structures and landscapes, they all make up historic places, and Steve and I are both interested in the whole big picture of historic places and their preservation. And the National Park Service preserves the nation's largest collection of historic structures and cultural landscapes. And Stephen, roughly how many historic structures are we preserving in the National Park System? Approximately 26,000. And we are preserving over 900 cultural landscapes in those 423 national park units. So a lot of historic places. And here we're looking at a whole range of different types of landscapes and structures that go from the East Coast all the way out to the far Pacific, that are part of the park system. And Stephen, you had a hand in restoring the Wesleyan Chapel on the top left here. And why is this building significant, Stephen? That's correct. So the Wesleyan Chapel, which is located at Women's Rights National Historic Park, is where the first Women's Rights Convention was held in 1848 and where the Declaration of Sentiments was first presented. Uh, this eventually led to the 19th Amendment in 1920. Wow. And we're also looking at a range of different types of landscapes associated with Euro-American settlement of the West in this orchard in Buckner uh, Orchard, North Cascades National Park. We're looking at a cemetery associated with Native Hawaiians in Palapapa on Malakai. Also the internment camp of the incarceration camp of Native Japanese Americans at Manzanar in California. And the bottom right here, we're looking at a very different building from the top left, Stephen, and that one that one appears to have a very um, different style of architecture. What can you just tell us about that one? Correct. So the White River Patrol Cabin, which is obviously located in Mount Rainier, uh, is an exa excellent example of the rustic style architecture. And this style was, the, was primarily used by the National Park Service for its park structures in the period between World War I and World War II. And it's a really gorgeous building, and I got to know it when I worked at Mount Rainier. So the, the role of the whole national program out of the Washington office um, is to sort of guide the parks in preserving structures and landscapes. Stephen, why don't you just talk a little bit about the role? Sure. Uh, it's a service-wide effort of staff in the parks, regional office and centers, uh, and including the Washington office, which is where Susan and I work. And, you know, we're dedicated to the preservation protection of, as we said, over 26,000 pre-contact and historic structures and approximately 900 cultural landscapes in the parks. So to, to do this, we, we work in three areas, research, planning, and stewardship. 
and will help guide the regions and the parks in their research, planning and stewardship efforts for historic factors and landscapes. And research is about learning what's precious to preserve, uh, getting the information that you need to preserve these resources in the future. And planning is about looking ahead to the future and how we will make adaptations, restoration, the treatment that we'll do, a vision for the future. And in stewardship, that's what I'd like to think of, or we both like to think of, is the dirt under your fingernails. Stewardship is the in perpetuity game. It's the care and feeding of these places. The stewardship that can preserves them in perpetuity. So Stephen, we have this opportunity to work with NICP interns and other kinds of interns as associates, and they do a lot of stuff. Great work for the National Park Service and Landscapes, don't they? Sure, we wouldn't be able to do what we do without them. Um, and to give some folks some uh, examples of how they assist us, uh, they prepare inventories involving historical research, field work, photo documentation, drawings, mapping and understanding change over time of the structures. They evaluate structures and landscapes for National Register eligibility, and they conduct field assessments of condition identifying sources of deterioration and costing repairs. And you also help us prepare treatment plans, those plans that look ahead to the future. And these are historic structure reports and cultural landscape reports. And they set a future vision for how we're going to manage and treat these places. And they also help us create educational and training materials for National Park Service staff and our partners in preservation. And they also help us by preparing content for our websites and social media. And of course, what we're about is raising awareness in the general public about these resources and having people learn about them. And the interns do a lot of work for us to help us with this. And we'd like to just tell you about interns that we have currently working with our program. And uh, Stephen, why don't you talk a little bit about Leah and Jeff? Sure. So uh, Leah is one of our fantastic interns. Uh, she's from Pennsylvania, background in library and information sciences, and she works in our public outreach and education, serves as our webmaster, webmaster and librarian. So she keeps our park historic structures and cultural landscape programs, websites uh, up to date and running smoothly. Uh, Jeff from Oklahoma, uh, his background is in English, library science and archives. Uh, he builds and manages our online collection of historic structures and cultural landscape reports, uh, which is an immense task because currently we have over 4,000 of those uh, documents. And most of those are available for you to download and read and we'll show you where you can find them in a minute. So Jackson, who's also currently with us, is from California, and he has a background in archaeology and in GIS, and he works to align data about historic structures and cultural landscapes with facility management data so that our facilities colleagues can get the money they need to, to work on these structures and landscapes and preserve them. And he also works on mapping for us. And then we also have Craig, and he is from Michigan, and his background is in architecture and public history. And he's also working on that similar effort to align the worlds of historic preservation with facility management by aligning data. And he also develops educational and training materials. He's a whiz with graphic design and de desktop publishing. Uh, he does a lot of materials for us. So we wanted to leave you with the, this page and Julie will share this with you. This has embedded links in it to where you can find out more information about historic structures and cultural landscapes. And of course, our, our emails over here. And one of the colleagues that works with us as a National Park Service employee is Karina Welsenbach. And she has background in historical landscape architecture, but she's also going to answer your questions. So Stephen, you have a couple of resources here online. Um, this is where people can download historic structure reports from about specific structures and parts. 
correct? And no doubt that Wesleyan Church that you worked on, the Wesleyan Chapel, started off with a historic factory report, right? To guide the work. And there's a SharePoint site for those of you that have access to the VPN to find out more information. We've got a cultural landscapes website, newsletters, also where you can find cultural landscape reports about the parks, follow us on social media, and also take some training. So all of these are live links that will take you to these sites. So really, we just want to welcome you here and please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was uh, really informative. Um, uh, Susan and Stephen, uh, really marvelous. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Um, our next speaker today is Jennifer Hanna. Uh, Jennifer is going to be sharing her screen with us. Um, Jennifer is a licensed landscape architect and has worked in historic preservation for 20 years in the United States, as well as Canada and England. She has a master's degree in historic preservation planning from Cornell University, like me, and a bachelor of landscape architecture. She currently serves as a historical landscape architect with National Park Service's Northeast Region's Olmsted Center for Landscape Preservation, where she helps parks manage their cultural landscapes and oversees the center's Designing the Parks internship program. This looks great, Jen. Great, thank you. And thank you very much, Julie, for the opportunity to, to uh, share the work of the Olmsted Center with you all today. Um, in the broadest sense, everything that we do at the Olmsted Center serves to strengthen the capacity of parks in the Northeast region um, to manage the cultural landscapes um, as part of our natural heritage. Now the center uh, provides direct support to park managers and to resource staff through a full range of services in research, planning, stewardship, and education. Now the slide that you see here is a group of our associates, our interns, we call them associates, in Acadia National Park. And I, I share this slide with you because it is important to note that everything that the Olmsted Center staff does in our assistance to parks to help manage their cultural landscapes, our associates do. And every year, the Olmsted Center um, engages with between seven and 14 associates who join us from areas from all over the United States and with backgrounds as varied as communication sciences, psychology, landscape architecture, historic preservation, history, law, the broad variety of um, interesting backgrounds. But the thing that draws them together is they have a really strong interest in place. And as Susan and Stephen mentioned, that is really what we're all about at the Olmsted Center is preserving these places that are significant to our history. A little bit about the Olmsted Center where we have seven full-time staff. Um, most of us are landscape architects. We have a couple of horticulturalists as well. We have one partner cooperator um, from the State University of New York Environment, uh, College of Environmental Science and Forestry. We have five seasonal staff that includes two, um, three, excuse me, cartographic technicians that help us with our mapping, as well as a horticulturalist and a landscape architecture technician. And then this year we have nine designing the parks associates and you see them here working on a planning project at our Boston facility. We have four offices. Um, we have an office in Boston, Philly, Richmond, and Syracuse, where SUNY ESF is located. Um, in 2021, this year, we have about 82 active projects in 35 parks within Region 1 or the Northeast region, um, which of course includes from, as Paloma kindly showed us, from Maine down to Virginia. And then every day we're providing technical assistance to all the park, well, to, to a park, at least one park um, in Region 1. 
the work that we do at the Olmstead Center really falls into three program areas, although they all really intersect. The first is planning. And here we're assisting parks with documenting history, existing conditions, and the significance of the cultural landscapes in their care. Here you see a group of our associates learning how to um, go through our mapping progress, uh, process or workflow. We also have a program um, in education and training. Here you see our associates actually in the park being trained by park staff. But the Olmstead Center also works with park staff around the country um, where we go into the parks and train um, in both um, park management as well as more hands-on training. Um, and that includes an arborist training program, which we are relaunching this year. And then finally, we also have a maintenance or stewardship program where we assist the parks, much like at the national level, to maintain, preserve, um, and care for their cultural landscapes. Um, cultural landscape inventories are a large part of the work that we do at the Olmstead Center. Um, a cultural landscape inventory is sort of a, a quick sort of uh, pass through to identify how a landscape evolved over time. And so we have three parts of this that the associates engage in as well as the staff. The first is field work. So you go out into the field and you try to determine what is there, what remains that tells the story of how this landscape developed. We also do research. We research at the archives at the park, as well as researching um, at uh, national archives. So in the National Archives and Records Administration, as well as private archives. And then finally, we create um, maps as well as narrative to document this history. Um, and you'll see here our map, which we create in um, ArcPro. We also create cultural landscape reports, which Susan mentioned. They're a deeper dive, a bigger dig into the history of place. Um, and here you see three that we did last, well, the year before last. Um, and as part of this, as I said, we dig deeper than we would in a cultural landscape inventory. And we also create period plans to capture a moment in time, what a landscape looked like at a particular moment so that we can better understand how that landscape developed and convey that evolution to both the park and the public. So you can see the contrast there. We also use the cultural landscape report to guide the future, as Susan mentioned, of these really important places that we are responsible for. So for instance, in a cultural landscape report, we can begin to understand and provide a basis for making decisions about park cultural landscapes. So for instance, at Sagamore Hill um, National Historic Site, we can understand and justify what trees to remove and then to restore the meadows and fields, making this landscape more authentically read or convey its past. We also provide technical assistance. The associates help us with this as well. This particular project is um, uh, for Acadia National Park, Isla Hot Acadia um, in Acadia was undergoing the rehabilitation of its um, or rails, or excuse me, its uh, circulation systems or its road systems. And so we wanted to make sure that those particular characteristics of this circulation or road system were conserved and preserved and rehabilitated so that they would be there. Um, the the um, slope on crown of the road, the, the margins of the road to preserve those elements that would um, convey again the historic authentic or authentic excuse me experience of this place. 
So again, the types of work that we do, um, we do field work. Here we have a group in Acadia National Park doing a trails um, survey. Here is another associate, Daisy, um, at the National Archives doing research for the Harriet Tubman National Underground Railroad, National Historical Park Cultural Landscape Report. Um, we also, you'll see in the bottom corner, a group who are doing a video shoot for a communications initiative where we were trying to tell the stories of these cultural landscapes in a very accessible way. And then finally, Marissa, um, who is helping to maintain the um, historic vegetation in our parks and to continue the legacy of the historic plant propagation program. So those are just some of the things that, that the associates at the Olmstead Center do um, and some of the work that we do. So thank you for allowing me to share this with you. And if you have any questions um, or just want to be in touch, there's my email address. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That was uh, a great uh, overview of your uh, center and the work that you do. And of course, as you said, this is the work that the um, interns do as well. So I appreciate that overview. It was great. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Jenna Mason Bornstead. Uh, she's a historical architect, landscape architect, and lead for the Historic Preservation Program at Joshua Tree National Park. She has a Master of Landscape Architecture and Historic Preservation degree from the University of Georgia and a BA in Art History and Archaeology from the University of Michigan. She's worked in a variety of uh, positions in five national parks, uh, MPS units since 2007, including roles that range from wildland fire resource advisor to interpretive ranger to NICP intern. So Jenna, uh, why don't you take it away? I see that you're sharing your screen. Yep, hi, can you all hear me all right? I'll unmute and say yes. Okay, great. Thank you, Julie. Thank you very much. I am honored and excited to share with you all about the Historic Preservation Program at Joshua Tree and the important roles that NICP interns here uh, have in helping us accomplish what we do. And I'll be giving uh, a bird's eye view glimpse at our park level historic preservation program that will give you an idea of what we're taking care of here, how we do that, and who is involved. And really, it's one example of a park level program. Uh, since all park units are a little bit different. Uh, first, a little context for those of you who might not be familiar with Joshua Tree National Park. We are located in sunny Southern California where the Mojave and Sonoran Deserts meet. Uh, the park encompasses almost 800,000 acres of rocky mountainous desert terrain, 86% of which is managed as wilderness. And that's important to consider when planning preservation work, since many of our cultural landscapes and historic structures are located in areas that are managed as wilderness. Uh, what are the historic resources we're taking care of at Joshua Tree? When you think of our park, it might immediately conjure up images of our quirky, very Instagrammable namesake tree, which is actually a yucca, uh, or you might think of a U2 album. Uh, you might be less familiar with the rich and layered cultural history of this area and the evidence of that on the landscape. And the historic resources in our park that fall within the scope of our preservation program primarily relate to mining and homesteading efforts, roughly dating from the 1890s through the Depression era. And the park itself was established as a national monument in 1936, so we also have some historic resources that relate to park development including that from the Mission 66 era, like the ranger station in this, uh, on this slide here. There are about 180 historic structures that we manage throughout the park, and they range in scale and complexity from just a steel water tank to pieces of equipment to retaining walls up to entire buildings or cultural landscapes. Uh, many of our structures are part of one of our five, soon to be six, cultural landscapes, that have been documented with a full cultural landscape inventory, um, all of which represent mining and homesteading. 
And there's a fair amount of variation in the materials we're, we're dealing with out here and the conditions that these resources are in. Uh, our structures are all pretty unique vernacular structures built of wood, adobe, metal, stone, uh, many of which include repurposed material. And many of our historic structures or resources are fairly humble and also very integrated into the landscape with mining cabins that are literally built into or underneath boulders uh, that pose pretty unique challenges to preservation. Our structures and landscapes are scattered throughout the park, so it can take a lot of advanced planning and time to access them. And many are manageable to get to within a day hike, but some require a long drive, some require four wheel drive roads, and some you have to get to during an overnight backpacking trip. And there are just a few examples highlighted on this slide here. So these sites are probably somewhat easier to access now than they were historically, but they were not necessarily built to last forever. Weathering, erosion, and general decay are the most common impacts that we're trying to preserve against. Uh, other threats that we frequently face at Joshua Tree include pest infestation. We have some pretty active termites out there. Uh, visitors and the damage that they cause like vandalism and graffiti and also wildfire, uh, park undertakings, and then accelerate, accelerating many of the above, of course, is climate change. And these are not all unique to Joshua Tree, but are things that could be impacting historic resources in just about any park unit. Understanding where and what historic resources we have at Joshua Tree, along with some of the threats and impacts we see. The question is, how do we manage and preserve these resources and who is part of those efforts? Uh, our historic structures and cultural landscapes team at Joshua Tree is pretty small. Right now, our preservation staff is really just me and one NICP intern, and there's another one who will be joining us next week. Um, so we work very closely as a team with the other cultural resources staff in our park to accomplish tasks and also engage park staff from other divisions whenever we can. But even when other park staff is interested in getting involved, they still have to do the jobs that they were hired to do. So we end up also relying a lot on volunteers to help out, including site caretakers, general preservation volunteers, project specific volunteers, and then larger organized volunteer events. Uh, we also rely a lot on partnerships with a few different conservation core groups and other preservation organizations. And these partnerships are usually project specific and established to um, accomplish funded preservation projects. And because a big part of what we do is based on preservation projects uh, that are planned and submitted for funding years in advance and then planned some more and finally carried out. And these are mostly larger comprehensive efforts to address known deficiencies like stabilization work, preventative or cyclic maintenance, or can be documentation and assessment based projects such as completion of a CLI or a CLR. Uh, and then partnering with outside organizations and conservation corps can help bring in special expertise or lots of people when needed. And it definitely expands the capacity of our small program. And our program responsibilities extend beyond completing specific preservation projects. Uh, we also need to complete continuous monitoring and condition assessments, which is something we often rely on NICP entrants to help accomplish. There's also a lot of data management and data entry, keeping up on field notes, completing photo logs, writing reports, and so on, that are essential to creating the record of what we've done that will help inform future preservation efforts. And then, there's also emergency preservation work that comes up, such as addressing graffiti or unexpected weather impacts. And I've kind of learned to always expect the unexpected out here. Um, and these are all things that we get NICP interns involved with based on the opportunities that come up. There's usually a specific project that an intern gets to work on throughout their time at Joshua Tree, like writing a determination of eligibility or a national register nomination. Um, along with the condition assessments and other field work throughout so that they get a good sampling of experience that they can apply throughout their career. 
Other tasks our preservation team needs to be involved with are park management actions, and this includes compliance work for undertakings, um, input or collaboration on other park projects like trail work or reviewing wayside plans, working groups that aim to address specific management needs, and then special committees like the Wilderness or Accessibility Committee. And ultimately, there's a lot of collaboration happening in the park, and that helps preservation efforts, and it also helps support overall park management. In closing, I wanted to highlight a few of the park, uh, perks of working in preservation at a park level. Uh, first, something that's been really important to me in working at a park for a number of years is the chance to really get to know the resources and build a connection and deeper understanding of these places. It's also great working on a variety of projects to expand your knowledge of different resource types and treatments, uh, which could include traditional trades or other innovative approaches. Something that's meaningful within all of our professions, of course, is that chance to be immersed in the stewardship of culture and heritage. And then working in a park specifically, you can get involved with the whole spectrum of park operations, which can actually help inform your understanding of cultural resource management as well. Um, and also having a national park as your backyard is pretty rad. It's great. It's really fun. And last but not least, one of the biggest perks for me is that chance to get outside and enjoy field work and get the dirt under the fingernails. Um, so thank you all very much for following along and thank you especially to all the NICP interns out there. I hope you're enjoying your experience and that this is a bright start to your career. You're really the ones who will perpetuate the field of historic preservation and cultural resource management. So please st stick with it and feel free to reach out if you'd like to connect. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank you so much, Jenna. And I really appreciate that uh, you were able to uh, explain not only what you do and your interns do, but how it relates to their future career uh, or potentially can relate to their future career. Uh, I really appreciate the 360 uh, view uh, of your work. Our last speaker, Heather File, is an architectural historian with the Alaska region of the National Park Service, where she writes about old buildings, advocates for their preservation while getting people excited about their history, telling all American stories through the built environment. Heather earned a BA in history and anthropology from the Montclair State University in New Jersey and an MA in Historic Preservation from Savannah College of Art and Design. Uh, so it looks like she has taken over uh, the screen and okay, take it away, Heather. Thank you, Julie. Can you hear me okay before you go off mute? <laughs> I went off mute and I'll come back on again to say yes, I can hear you. Great, I'm really glad to be coming in last because this is a really great way to connect what uh, the Washington office has said about the programs and all the way down to the park level programs. So I've been asked to show how regional offices support the stewardship of uh, historic structures and cultural landscapes, and I'm really happy to do so. The first thing I want to note is I started my preservation career also as a NICB intern An architectural historian with the Alaska Regional Office. As Paloma mentioned at the beginning, uh, the regional offices are separated out by these geographic areas. And we went through a little bit of a reorganization in 2018 with these numbers. So you might hear the legacy names or you might hear the region numbers. And this is just to point out that I am in the Alaska region, but that's also DOI region 11. Specifically, we have a big uh, mission statement within the regional office itself, but for historic structures and cultural landscapes, we're primarily here to assist the parks. Let's look at what that might look like. So Alaska is a pretty big landmass. Um, I think you guys are all aware of that. We only have 17 different national park system sites in Alaska. Uh, 15 of those are parks and preserves, so kind of a two for one deal. But what we lack in numbers, we make up for in land mass and logistics. So it's um, a pretty difficult task to get out to even inventory our historic structures and cultural landscapes. 
let alone to be able to be good stewards of them. We're gonna kind of go through the steps that it takes in Alaska to make that work and also how interns are in are definitely a key piece in that process. Looking at the historic architecture and cultural landscapes branch in the Alaska Regional Office, right now it's a team of two that support the parks. It's uh, myself and then my boss is Grant Crosby, who's a senior historical architect. So obviously we can't do it all without other assistance. And as other people have mentioned, we kind of start from the stepping stones. We have the organic act that establishes the national park system itself. And then each and every single park has its enabling legislation as to why it's important. And then there's guiding documents that then help to assist what else we what we should be prioritizing. And everything that we look at for both historic structures and cultural landscapes is looked at through the lens of the National Register of Historic Places. It's literally the list of historic properties that are worth preservation for in these four different categories of event, person, architectural engineering, and information potential. But it doesn't, something has to have significance, but also has to retain integrity and not just structural integrity, more so along these seven aspects of integrity that the National Register has established, location, design, setting, work, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. And all those things wrap up into does this place on the earth still tell the story that it's important for? So we're talking about these two things. And as Susan had mentioned, it's two sides of the same coin. So historic structures and cultural landscape working together so those historic structures are those individual buildings and structures, and they're typically part of a landscape. And then that cultural landscape is that whole place, including the structure and the views and the vegetation, roads, trails, small scale features. So the way I like to remember it is it's kind of like a chicken. Stick with me. Um, the thigh and the drumstick and the back, those are the historic structures. But the whole thing that makes it a chicken is what makes it the cultural landscape. So we start in that same spot that Susan mentioned. We start with the research and documentation section. We're going to look at what we have. And for us, it's hard to get out to see what we have. Um, so here on the historic structures column is Soapy Smith's um, within Klondike Gold Rush. And I just wanted to point out that this was an intern from 2008. Uh, she came up, her name is uh, Tara. She came up and she was working on a master's degree in historic preservation, liked what she did, was doing so much with us that she went back down and pursued a secondary degree within uh, architecture and is now a licensed historical architect on the East Coast. And landscapes, here's Brenner Mines in Wrangell St. Elias, and this takes two plane trips to get to. And sometimes we end up with uh, historic American building survey data as well out of this fieldwork. Of course, we're looking at research within our own repositories, within the parks themselves, and also National Archives. And the research and documentation has taken some great leaps in the areas of technology as of late. So the photo in the historic structures column is the Kentishna Roadhouse in Denali National Park and Preserve, and then um, the GIS work being done at the Chilkoot Trail in Klondike Gold Rush. Just want to show you a little bit more about that, what that scanner can do. So that's a Trimble T. Take us two or three weeks in the field with a team of three. Now takes us two or three days in the field with a team of two to be able to get this information and be able to take this back to the office. And then from that information, we can develop not only interpretive material, but also HABs documentation as well. So looking at it as a landscape scale, this is also helpful for us. So this is Kennecott Mines National Historic Landmark District within Wrangell St. Elias. And that has been also scanned with a variety of uh, products, but including the Trimble TX8. It's really great to be able to have that research and documentation, but then we need something else to be able to show for it. And typically what, we, what we'd like to at least end up with after the field season is over, is some kind of determination of eligibility. So in that first column, we're looking at determination of eligibility that we reservation office and with cultural determination of eligibility in the form of that CLI that 
you are deep and familiar with. And the highest goal, uh, and actually based off of what the law is actually saying, we should aim for a national register nomination. So this is Mount McKinley National Park Historic District that we did end up completing that nomination. And that is also a story that our interns are instrumental in is being able to. So we have a group inventory system between the four different dif disciplines for the cultural resource inventory system. So we have the two that we're concerned with in our branch is the historic structure side and that cultural landscape side. And this is a reason that they have to be able to be better stewards of them. It's really great for our partners and facilities as well. Once we get to the treatment option and the planning option and stewardship of the resources we now know that we are stewards of, we look to the Secretary of Interior standards, of course, and then we can develop those bigger deep dive documents that have already been talked about. So we have the historic structures report and we have that cultural landscapes report. Those not only go into a deep dive detail of the history of the structure, but again, shows what, why that structure is significant or landscape is significant and what would help improve it to be able to tell that story. So here's an example. This is actually from the Olmstead Center, but up here in Alaska. Uh, Mount McKinley National Park Headquarters District. Over the years, the parking had um, taken over as it often does with anyone with a vehicle. So you can see these green areas that have become parking when in fact, during the period of significance, they were uh, tundra. And so the recommendation coming out of the CLR was to restore that. So we were happy to say that that work was completed and, it, and this landscape can better convey its significance now. Looking into st other stewardship options, we have other documents that we can produce, like designed guidelines and vegetation treatment and preservation maintenance plans on the landscape side. That design guidelines, uh, one of the key pieces is to be able to show and illustrate the character defining features, mostly for our partners within facilities. And then on the vegetation management side, looking at one page out of that Glacier Bay Lodge, uh, what the views and vistas were during the period of significance and what they had become now. So the alders had grown up and you could no longer see the water. So it was recommended that those get uh, taken back. And in fact, that treatment was also accomplished. And nothing is simple, no, there's never anything simple. So um, many areas we deal with layers of significance. And so we're gonna look really quick at Katmai National Park and Preserve in the spot on the earth where most of our visitors come which is Brooks Camp. There are four different landscape districts right on top of each other that tell a different story. And so with the help of our interns, we were able to develop this poster series that would go over what was significant about that. So we can kind of say like what this district is, what's the significance, what's the condition, what are those char character defining features? And then we were able to do that for those four main historic districts that are right on top of each other at Brooks Camp. So Alaska helps to manage with, the, with partnership with our parks over 700 historic structures. We have 53 completed CLIs and another 60 that have been identified for the cultural landscape program. And we're just here to be able to support the parks, support our resource staff, support our facility staff to be better stewards of our resources. That's the end of my presentation. All right, thank you so much. I really appreciate that overview, Heather. Um, even uh, though we, um, uh, uh, your um, your voice and the video got uh, muted a few times, I think that was just uh, uh, transmission problems. So, but thank you very much. You did a great recovery there, and uh, I think I will. Um, we had one question and uh, I'll ask that before we go into my last slide, uh, which is, um, yeah, um, uh, for Susan and Jenna and Heather, where were all your NICB internships held and what did you do as an intern? So as I share the screen again, um, maybe uh, you can 
pop in uh, and answer those questions. Uh, Julie, I, I put my answer in the chat, but I can say it again. Um, so I began working for the National Park Service as a NICP in 1995 in Washington, DC. At the time I was doing a master's in landscape architecture at the University of Oregon in Eugene, Oregon. And I ended up spending about three months in the summertime in Washington, DC, which was quite an eye-opening eye experience, heat and humidity. And I worked for the person in the role that I am now. So I worked for the Park Cultural Landscapes Program Manager, Bob Page, and I helped to co-author a document with him that was ultimately published a couple of years later. And it was a guide to cultural landscape reports. And it was just an incredible honor to help prepare this document that is a guide for the National Park Service in how to write cultural landscape reports. So it was quite a wonderful experience. And I'm so grateful to him for that. That's, that's marvelous. Uh, how about Jenna or um, let's see, who else? Uh, Heather, you know, um, Jenna? Yeah, um, I actually started as a NICP intern at Joshua Tree, and uh, I was working on a determination of eligibility for the Black Rock Campground at our park. And I'm actually one of three people at Joshua Tree um, who used to be NICP interns who now work for the park. So pretty cool. Keep us keep us here. <laughs> That's wonderful to hear. Uh, and Heather, how about you? Where'd you where'd you intern? Hopefully you guys can hear me. Uh, I interned at Grant Coors Ranch National Historic Site in Deer Lodge, Montana, and I worked for the facilities division there doing physical preservation work and working within what would now be called the Chris HS for them, the list of classified structures at the time. Marvelous. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing and hopefully inspiring uh, our, our interns. Uh, so I just wanted to follow up uh, uh, about our la and provide information about our last webinar of the summer series. And it's taking place a week from today, Thursday, uh, July 29th at 3 p.m. Eastern on the topic of archaeology. Uh, we have four speakers for that event. Uh, archaeologists will be speaking from the Washington Support Office, WASO, the Northeast Region, the Southeast Archaeological Center, and we have a speaker from White Sands National Park in New Mexico. And please register if you haven't already. Um, and earlier, I just want to point out earlier that day, July 29th at noon central, is a webinar hosted by the National Trust for Historic Preservation, uh, along with the Till family in Chicago and the Emmett Till Interpretive Center in Sumner, Mississippi, about the campaign to create an Emmett Till and Mamie Till Mobley National Park. So these groups are joining together to spearhead a national effort to preserve, restore, and interpret sites associated with the life and murder of Emmett Till and the miscarriage, uh, of, miscarriage of justice that followed. You can register at the link on the screen to learn more about this advocacy effort. So I think with that, uh, thank you all for uh, to our panelists for sharing your email addresses, uh, but here they are again. Uh, and thank you to all of our um, attendees for uh, showing up and, and uh, asking the questions and uh, uh, taking part in your internships and in this series. Yes, thank you. Um, I also want to thank everyone for joining and Julie for moderating and I am happy to answer any questions about internships with the Park Service. Um, I work with partners in parks um, in, in administering internships, so I'm happy to talk about that topic. Um, and a question, can you share the link? Yes, Julie, will be, you be able to share that with those who registered? Uh, that is a great question, and I will do that. I will, um, if you registered for today's event, I will send out a link to next week's program and to the um, Emmett Till um, uh, 
uh, webinar hosted by the National Trust. Great, fantastic. You can probably also um, Google that topic and webinar. Um, it's put on by the trust, right? The National Trust for Historic Preservation. So it they is. probably have that out there somewhere uh, uh, in the web. Yes, I, I just got the notice of it today. So um, yeah, I'm sure it is. Uh, savingplaces.org is their website. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I appreciate it. This was uh, great. I'm going to uh, sign off now, and I guess that'll be it. Thank you <laughs> all. Thanks. See you next week. <laughs> all right. <laughs> thank you. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.